Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to join us. This is the uh, Moscolo Skeletal Low Back Pain Management webinar for Tier 1 cohort, uh, led by um, Sue Ellen Pereira and Chuki here. Please, would you introduce yourselves? Hi, good afternoon. My name is Ellen Pereira, and I'm the first contact physiotherapist. I work in primary care mostly. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm G. I'm a senior health and wellbeing coach. I've been in this role for about three years now, but my speciality is yoga, functional yoga, and naturopathy. And I'm going to be supporting Sue today. Thank you so much, Yasmina. Okay. Um, so today we're going to touch up on a little bit of low back pain. I've kept uh, some time at the end of the session for questions and any cases uh, that you might have that you want to discuss with me. I'm going to keep it fairly light. So if you all want to, um, you know, um, ask me for more detail, I'm happy for, for you all to ask me for more detail because then we can go into that a little bit more, okay? Um, yes, Rina, next slide, please. Perfect. Um, so if we're looking at um, low back pain, uh, sorry, Yasmin, I can't see the slide. Sorry, just bear with me for a moment. Um, yes, Mina, um, we can't see the slides. Would it be possible for you to bring them up again, please? Bear with us for a minute. We're having some technical issues. <laughs> Hello, Yasmina. Sorry, everyone. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Sorry, everyone. I will just get the the slides back up. Can you see it? Yes, it's back on now. <laughs> Thank you so much. Is that um, okay. Yes, we can see that okay. Thank you so much. Um, so if you're looking at back pain, everybody has had back pain at some point in time in their life or not, right? Um, and, and we would mostly call that type of back pain like a non-specific uh, or mechanical uh, back pain that is, of course, not caused by any infection or fracture, any trauma or any cancers as such. And then some people also have some back pain which comes down into the legs, which is known as your sciatica or your nerve related back pain. OK, um, whenever there is a nerve related back pain, um, it's an irritation of the nerve into the leg and it can happen for various reasons. Um, and of course, the pain is uh, it can cause numbness, pins and needles or even tingling down the leg. Yasmina, could we go to the next slide, please? OK, so there's different types of back pains. Uh, there's your acute back pain, there's your subacute back pain, and there's your chronic back pain. Your acute back pain is in that initial stage. Uh, your subacute is for a little longer, which is between 6 to 12 weeks, and your chronic back pain, which is 12 weeks or more. When we're, when we're discussing of how to manage back pain, the easiest back pain to treat, of course, is the chronic or the subacute back pain, uh, because most likely than not, it's very related to someone picking up something from the floor, someone carrying something heavy, um, someone someone doing something as simple as carrying their baby off, off, off you know, uh, back from school. Your, your chronic back pains are the ones that tend to stay for a year or 12 weeks or longer. 
um, and those type of back pains are a little bit more difficult to treat, um, but I wouldn't say impossible. If we could go to the next slide, please. Okay. Um, now, I've kept this not to scare y'all, but just for you to understand that there are many different things in the back that can cause pain. So if you look at the picture, um, it's a very scary, scary looking image of the spine, but there's bones, there's discs, there's nerves, there's ligaments, there's muscles, and there's skin. Uh, and not all of the back pain is related to disc, not all of the back pain is related to the bone, and not all of the back pain is related to the nerves. Very often than not, it is the ligaments, it is the muscles, it is the fascia that go into tightness that irritate the structures that are underneath that. Could we go to the next slide, please? Okay. Um, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna touch a little bit about pain, right? So there's different types of pain. There's pain which is comes from the the, the muscular system, so to speak, which is your achy pain, your throbbing pain. Most of y'all would have discussed this as like a toothache type of pain that is known as somatic pain. Visceral pain feels like the pain is all over. Um, and, if, and mostly it comes from your, your stomach or, um, or, or parts around the stomach. And if there's something that the system is basically causing. So that's your visceral type of pain. Your neuropathic pain is, is your burning, shooting, electric, tingling, stabbing pain, which is mostly related to a nerve, okay? And this is a very old article that, that shows the type of pain, but it hasn't changed from there. So I've, I've put this so that you can understand the different types of pain. If you could go to the next slide, please. Perfect. Um, so when we look at look at low back pain, right, and the types of pain that cause it, most likely people will say that they have um, a an achy pain. That achy pain is mostly coming from the muscles when the muscles go into a spasm. Your neuropathic pain, the pain which has pins and needles or your sharp shooting pain down the le leg, is basically caused from the nerve which is irritated. If you look at this nice picture on the left hand side that shows the pressure on the disc of the body, something as simple as putting on your socks or lifting up something from the floor or, and, and if you see the most is bending and lifting. So even at something as simple as picking up your shoe from the, from the floor can give rise to that muscular type of pain, cause the muscle to go into spasm and can cause those flare-ups of your back pain if the patient has had a back pain for a while or even new episodes of back pain. So what is important here in, in, in this moment is to reassure your patient that they don't have to do something very heavy or very serious to cause those spasms in your back pain. If we could go to the next slide, please. Okay, um, so I'm going to skip this part because I wouldn't want you to examine the back pain. Um, so we could go to the next slide again, please. Uh, but if you think that there is examination of your back pain, you could please send them to your first contact physiotherapist who are in your GP surgeries or your GP practitioners as well. Now, I put this slide on for you all to understand that there are many things that impact back pain. Okay, and as physiotherapists, we call those flags, right? Uh, red flags, yellow flags, orange flags, blue flags, and black flags. And very often than not, back pain stays for other reasons. So when we look at a patient, a patient who comes in who has depression, anxiety, or personality disorders, that can affect the back pain. If we look at beliefs, judgments, and emotional responses that can also trigger your flare-ups of back pain. So if you have a patient who comes in with the back pain that is just not going away, 
and understands that, you know, if they had a bad treatment with physiotherapy before and the patient has not gotten better from physiotherapy before, or the patient has saying, you know, I'm taking very long time to go back to work. We need to kind of speak to them about those beliefs behind back pain, because even those things like delayed response to work, distress about things can cause flare ups of the back pain, can cause the back pain to actually stay much longer. Because as we know, stress is one big thing that can aggravate back pain, right? So if they're worried about not being able to go back to work, worried about, you know, having a fear, say if you have someone who works at Greg's or if you have someone who works at Tesco or a warehouse, right? These type of patients are going to be like, sorry. What, is that Laura? It is. Laura, excuse me, I just took a bite of a sandwich. It's Angie. You're right, Angie. Um, I thought... Gently, I know, so gently, let me just take a bite of this. I'm in training and also, so I'm on the Neighbours app because the training. Um... Oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Let me just go back. Um, so, Sue Ellen, I've just muted everyone, so please unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank I'll just... you. <laughs> All right, no problem. I'll start sharing. Sorry about that. <laughs> Yes, please, everyone, make sure to mute yourselves upon entry. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask, yeah, perfect. Sorry. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, you so you know, working at Tesco or a warehouse or, you know, Greg's, and, and they're worried about lifting up heavy weights uh, or lifting up, up bags or, you know, um, doing all of these things this fear and anxiety can also feed back into how they're responding to treatment and management of back pain so here is where that reassurance comes into place right um another thing that you normally hear is is people with back pain who are scared of doing things somebody would have said okay you know what don't bend because that's going to aggravate your back pain um, don't lift up weights more than 25 kgs because that's going to aggravate your back pain. We need to understand that fear avoidance will also increase your management of back pain because what happens is your body, your body is a very smart body. It's a very, it's a very um, sharp body. So if, if, if you learn that something is supposed to be avoided, something is not supposed to be done, your body will naturally understand that and take that as a belief system so that when you're going to lift up something heavy the next time the pain is going to come as a protective response because your back is going to go into a spasm when you're going to lift that up so which is going to cause a flare-up of the pain but it's it's actually the pain behavior and your belief system behind it so when you're talking to patients about this i would try to avoid terminology like uh, say don't do that. However, I would say avoid doing that for some time till your pain dies down a little bit more. Um, then we're looking at perceptions, we're looking at blue flags. So let's look at perceptions between work and health, right? Some people believe that, um, you know, going back to work is going to cause further injury. Some people believe that work pay is supervisor and workmates are unsupported. So these belief systems will also give rise to that perceptive pain, that chronic understanding of pain because the patient does not feel safe in their body to go back to work. So the back pain will automatically flare up as a stress response to the pain. OK, then, of course, we look at black flags, uh, which all of us, I think, at some point of time have faced this with, with people who come in. And this actually, in terms of chronic back pain, this actually gives rise to actual symptoms in the patient because they have a belief system uh, that they're working against the system or, or pain is actually not working for them. So. When you're looking at your patient, please, please be aware that these black flags are definitely going to be there in the patient and it gives actual
actual real symptoms in the patient. So it is actually targeting. What we need to do is target the belief systems of the patients that come into play. Um, so we basically need to reassure them that we're here to support them and we're here to actually get them a lot better. In terms of your red flags, right on the top, I would leave that to your GP to worry about that, okay? So don't touch about that right now. If we can go to the next slide, yes, Mina. If you could skip this slide as well, skip the slide as well. Perfect. So in terms of management strategies, I put this um, BMJ, but I'm going to share resources or nice guidelines so that you can have a look at it, okay? When you look at back pain, imaging is is contraindicated, so to speak, because uh, nothing's going to happen with imaging. It's not going to change our treatment. So we wouldn't normally, you know, do an imaging for a patient unless we are suspecting something serious. In terms of self-management for the back pain, we're going to give power to the patient. We're going to tell the patient that they need to be active. They need to move around because the, the faster that they get back to doing doing the things that they normally do the pain responds a lot better to it and will automatically ease up as soon as possible um in terms of um injections for someone who's had pain for a longer period of time or that that nerve related pain even then only if the pain has been there for more than 18 months or more than a year would would we actually actually try to do anything more but your first line of treatment for the management of this would be to speak about you know um just managing the condition in terms of your exercises being more uh, more open to movement so you can ask your patients to go for a walk but reassure them that they're going to get better because that reassurance is very important in talking to them about what works for them and their goals and how they need to go back um, back to work, basically. I'm going to share a little bit in, in terms of resources, in, um, in terms of exercises that you can signpost them to, which are, is on NHS website, in terms of fitness that they can do in terms of NHS website, and also a little bit about that y'all can read up in terms of NICE guidelines, in terms of um, um, resources basically for y'all to look at okay i'm going to open this up to questions now if y'all have any questions for me so feel free to unmute yourself and ask any questions or pop them in the chat if you'll have any questions at all no okay so um i'm gonna i'm gonna put a couple of um, links in, in the chat and I'm going to have uh, G take over. Thanks, Sue Ellen. Thanks. That's great. <clears throat> so, um, right. So I'm going to just look at how the personalised care roles, um, such as uh, the health coaches, social prescribers, care coordinators can support people either with the early intervention, which is preventing back pain, that's my speciality, and um, also those who are experiencing long-term pain, how we can support to manage them or facilitate uh, their well-being and I think Sue Ellen touched on a, a couple of points there already which is to do with their belief systems um, looking at the other factors that may be contributing to their uh, musculoskeletal pain and that's not just lower back pain but also neck shoulder tension where do we hold our tension when we are stressed okay next slide please so many of you may have already seen this slide. I have been sharing this across the um, education platform, which is just looking at what our individual roles are. I'm sure many of you are aware of the, um, uh, 
the personalised care roles, but what do we actually do? How can we actually contribute and support GPs and healthcare professionals? Um, so health and wellbeing coaches, really our aim, we're, we're non-clinical first, all of the personalised care roles are non-clinical. So we're here to uncover the rest of the story. So what matters to the patient aside from their clinical symptoms and what they're showing up with. Um, with health and wellbeing coaches, we will be looking at changing their behavior, understanding what their belief patterns are. Um, we're not directive or prescriptive in any way. We are here to listen to the patient. And actually that's one of the feedbacks we get that patients feel heard and understood for the first time because they're given the time to do so. Most of our sessions are about an hour long. Um, in pain management, it's a lot to do with uh, motivational interviewing, changing their mindset about their pain, um, and looking at ways to improve their pain by, or not improve their pain, but um, decrease their pain by looking at their lifestyle habits. So looking at stress triggers, how can we reduce the impact of stress, and so on and so forth. Social prescribers are fantastic at really signposting patients to those resources um, that would benefit patients. It could be housing matters, it could be financial matters, it could be just to alleviate some of the stress load. It could be as simple as getting a, a ride from their home to um, a, a, physio a physiotherapy appointment because their pain is so crippling and degenerating that they can't move. So it's really about looking at activities that are suited for patients to support them managing their pain, maybe even connecting them to community groups uh, where they feel more supported and understood. Um, with care coordinators, they really work alongside uh, uh, patients in a person-centered way and have a much bigger view of the whole picture of that patient's care. And um, a, a lot of care coordinators will look at navigating the care plans for patients to ensure that they uh, have access to the right care at the right time. All of the personalized care roles look at transforming conversations from what's the matter with you to really what matters to the patient. Let's get to the heart of the problem. Next slide, please. How many of you have accessed your personalized care team? How many of you have, are working with them? Uh, uh, I'd be really interested to know, so just pop it into the chat box. Um, it's very easy to access uh, the personalized care team. It's through uh, the referral process. It's actually through EMS or System 1, and you select social prescribing, and you'll be onto the JOY platform, which is the personalized care platform, where we receive referrals and will signpost them to the appropriate member of the team. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, really, we don't... As personalised care um, uh, uh, individuals, we don't really get into the clinical side uh, of uh, the, the disease or the, the issue of the, for the patient. What we're doing is uncovering the, um, the rest of the story, what other factors contribute to the well-being. So it's a very holistic approach. I like to see it as hugging the patient. Right now, this patient has got back pain, but what's actually contributing to that back pain? Is it that they don't have a comfortable seat at work? Is it uh, home-related stress? Have they got too much that they can't cope with? And that's impacting their um, overall well-being. Um, so I'm not gonna share any client stories today, but what I would like to focus on is a brilliant technique that I've been using for many, many years, with staff members and my patients to really for um, alleviating that lower back pain, as well as managing long-term pain and early prevention. Next slide, please. Um, these are some of the, the, the feedback that we've had from patients and I will let you take uh, a moment to read that. So it's really providing them with positive regular contact, 
a, a, a safe space to really discuss what is causing them um, uh, the, the pain at the moment um, and listening. Next slide, please. Okay, so early intervention for postural care. So this is really looking at the whole body. Um, some uh, quick take home uh, recipes or um, uh, kind of uh, things that really helped patients um, is hydrotherapy. So anything in the water, why does that help? Uh, it allows the body to float. It allows the joints to uh, really have a break. Um, and when you're learning to float or just be in water, it just gives you that sense of buoyancy. So thereby just alleviating that pressure on the jo joint or the muscle. Hydrotherapy is a fantastic therapy that I highly recommend uh, for patients with uh, lower back pain or hip pain or neck pain. Um, yes, uh, Monzana, that nuffield joint probe is fantastic. I, I agree. Um, I'm speaking from experience. I, I suffered with a lot of chronic hip pain and osteoarthritis, uh, fairly young in my age, um, which I overcame by using these techniques. So I'm quite passionate about um, alleviating, you know, pain in general. Um, uh, also Epsom bath salts. So if they can't get to a swimming pool, you can use Epsom bath salts at home. Magnesium sulfate is a great way of reducing inflammation, a really old school technique which works. And it's an essential mineral for muscle and nerve health. Magnesium is essential for our, um, our, our body's uh, well-being. And as you probably all know, Epsom bath salts reduces inflammation. From the Royal, uh, the Royal Osteoporosis Society was just looking on their website. Nutritionally, as a nutritional expert, I always recommend vitamin D3 and K2. About 4,000 international units a day is just about enough to uh, really make sure that our vitamin D levels, especially over the winter period, um, is um, optimized. Not only that, if we think about our workplace well-being, how much time do we actually spend outdoors? So these are factors that we really need to be thinking about. I know certainly um, in, in my profession, I'm indoors whilst the sun is shining and I step out when the sun has set. So how much vitamin D am I actually getting from the sun at the moment? Um, also, omega-3 fatty acids, oily fish or flaxseed for those vegetarian, about 1,000 milligrams a day is uh, very, very important to preserve our bone health as well as our joint health. And I've already mentioned magnesium. Um, I do a lot of workplace well-being solutions. So if you go to my website, um, I've been providing the British Association of Dermatologists some postural care. Um, and you'll find some great yoga, seated yoga techniques um, at your disposal if you so wish to try them. My final point is using the breath. And this is really in stretching, stretching the joints. So whilst we're seated in a chair or at our workplace, workstation, how many of us are really aware of our breath when we're talking, when we're speaking? How many of us actually take time just to have a stretch and inhale whilst we're too stretching out and exhale when we're returning uh, uh, our body to a neutral position? So let's have a, a five minute look at how these exercises can serve you in the workplace. Next slide, please. So what I'm going to talk about is um, stacking the joints. So I like to call this being in your seat of power. Uh, it's a, a, a yoga chair pose, but we're gonna do this seated. And it's, it's very functional, meaning you can do this at any time of the day. You don't need to get up to go to a gym. You don't need a yoga mat. You can actually do it in your seat, whether you're driving or whether you're at home or in your workplace. Um, and it's very important to learn to stack the joints. If you think about it, everything starts from our feet and then we engage the joints. So this is a part of uh, the spiral loops that work through our body. So if someone comes to me and their ankle is given away, let's say their, their right ankle has given away, 
already I know that the pain is radiating into the opposite knee and then reflecting in the opposite hip and then the opposite rib and so forth, so on and so forth. So it's a crisscross fashion. Muscles spiral around our, our, our bones. Um, and so therefore, to learn to stack our joints whilst we're seated from the ankles up to the hips, enabling our hips and our upper torso to float using the breath and then making sure that our shoulders are aligned with the hip joint and our neck is in a, a, a neutral spine position. How are we gonna do that? So I invite you all firstly to sit in your seat. Let me just bring this down a bit. Invite you to sit comfortably in your seat. Just be mindful if your chair has uh, wheels on it. You don't wanna push yourself away or cause yourself any injury. Um, I'm gonna invite you to stretch your feet out in front of you and slowly, oh, by the way, if you've got high heels on, I advise that you take them off to do this. So just be in, in you know, your feet, just make sure the, the floor is, is clean. So invite you to stretch your feet out in front of you and slowly slide them back. So you're feeling the resistance against the floor and you're sliding them back until your ankles are in line with your knees. Okay, lift the toes up from the floor and just place them big toe, little toe and allow them to rest. So you can really, you're pressing down into the floor, the surface. And now I'm gonna invite you to sink your heel into the ground. What can you feel? Can you feel your glutes? activate? Are you feeling your hamstrings active? So this is a really easy grounding technique which helps the body to begin to um, sit in its active position. It's also a great way to manage stress tension in the body. Now I'm going to invite you to use your hands and just spiral so you're massaging the skin around in uh, an uh, what's this way, a clockwise fashion. So towards the midline of the body, you're literally spiraling the flesh or your skin around to the midline of the body and you're working up to the knees and you're gonna polish the knees using your hands. So you're gonna generate some heat by polishing the knees. Now I'm gonna invite you to lift the skin of your thighs around. So you're spiraling it, I'm just gonna show you, you're spiraling the flesh towards the inseam of the body. So you're literally turning the skin. And there's reason to this madness, which you'll experience in a minute, and the other side. So you're literally, don't be shy, lift, but peel the skin of the buttocks backwards. So you're really peeling the skin. So what you're doing here is you're releasing the sit bones. Now already, if you've done this um, correctly, you'll find that you're now sitting on your sit bones and your spine is already sitting in neutral. So it's created some space between the hip and your sacrum. Can everyone feel that? Okay, we're just gonna do a little twist, seated twist. So taking the left hand and just holding the seat wherever it's comfortable, your chair. Right hand, we're gonna place that on our opposite knee. So the left knee, we're going to take a deep breath in and we're going to twist, twist towards the left and turn your neck to look the opposite direction. So it's almost as though you're wringing out, again, in a spiral fashion, any tension you're holding in the muscles. And slowly we're gonna bring that to center. And we're gonna do that on the other side. So taking the left hand and placing it on the right knee, taking the right hand and placing it comfortably on the chair somewhere, 
on the leg or the side. We're going to take a deep breath in and we're going to turn to the opposite direction. So we're turning towards the right and turn your neck so it's facing the opposite direction. Just notice where you're feeling tension and breathe into it. So take a deep breath in and release. And back to neutral. Again, we're going to take a deep breath in and just raise the arms up ahead of you. So breathing in, clasping the hands above your head, taking an inhale and really giving your side body a nice stretch. Releasing the hands, we're going to clasp the back of the chair and hinge forwards from the hips. So it's like doing, I suppose, bending forwards, but allowing the arms to stretch behind us. So our shoulder blades are almost being kissing towards the back. So they're coming together, really releasing any tension along the spine. Wonderful. And you're gonna release that and just come back to center. Can you feel the tension? Release. Now you're just going to shrug the shoulders up, roll them back. Clasp your hands behind your neck and just give it a little bit of a lift. So it's almost as though you're pulling or stretching the whole of that spine whilst you're sitting on your sit bones. I invite you to remind yourself your heels are pressing down on the floor. When your heels press down on the floor, you'll feel a really lovely lengthening. And one last instruction. So now we're going to raise our hands in front of us, moving forward, almost as though we're trying to move off the seat and we're trying to grab something. So you're gonna push down with your feet, hinging forwards at the hips, folding forwards and just literally lift your buttocks off the chair. So you are now in a yoga chair pose. This is probably one of the best uh, yoga poses you can do because it lengthens the spine. And builds strength in the whole body it powers you up, it will really heat you up as well. Um, so that's a, a great tip that I'm going to share with you uh, from uh, my uh, yoga expertise, just to keep the posture in a neutral position and be a bit more mindful about how we're using the joints and sitting uh, at, it, you know, at our workplace or whilst we're driving or doing our functional movements during the day. And really, yoga combined with acupressure, it systematically triggers neurophysiological resting reflexes. So they not only relax the body, they also help to restore and recharge it. I hope you all enjoyed that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I've just put some um, stretching and desk yoga poses here for you to all try. Just remember stretching the body and stacking the body. It strengthens, uh, you can use resistance bands. I always encourage people to use resistance bands to build strength. Spiral movement of the body stabilizes um, the posture and always remember to sit on your sit bones not on your sacrum. That's a neat trick. If all you ever do is lift the skin of your buttocks backwards to release the lower, the, the spine, then you will avoid back pain. Thank you. I think that's all I have. Any questions? Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Any questions? Please don't hesitate to write anything into the chat. Uh, before you go, before you go, please, 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 would you take 20 seconds to uh, put in any of your thoughts about this uh, webinar? It's multiple choice. You just have to put in your full name. I promise that's the only thing you have to put or further recommendations if you feel you have any. 
Uh, here it is. Oh. I don't see. Thank you very much for your comments. Thank you. Monata, lovely to see you again. Um, in terms of the slides being sent out, I see that is one of the questions. Um, normally I have to, oh, okay. So I see Sue Ellen and, and G are quite happy for me to do this. Um, I'll make sure to send them out to you to Tracy Kavanagh. Um, all of you have my email. If any of you would like the slides as well, please do get in touch. I'm happy to send them to you as well. Wonderful. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you everyone for joining. Any other questions? No? For anyone who's interested, tomorrow we have a COPD for Tier 1 um, cohort. Uh, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. I don't know what it was before I started organising this webinar, so that's why I'm telling you. I'm sure you did already. But if you are interested, please, please, please don't hesitate to uh, join. I will send out some links. Otherwise, I will stop the recording. Thank you very much, everybody. Yes, yes, no problem. I'll send it out to all the people who participated today, the COPD link for tomorrow with Usma. NG, will you be joining? I think so. Yes, fantastic. All right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.